All right, let's let's talk about prefetching today. This is our 27th lecture. That's quite a few lectures, actually. So I hope you're keeping up well. Are you guys all on top of the topics? So, so well, we'll add another review session, or uh, otherwise called a spring carnival, <laughs> uh, for you to catch up. We won't have a review session at that time, but that's a good time to actually catch up, perhaps. So we won't have a lecture on Friday. And hopefully this lecture would be useful for your extra credit assignment in the next, uh, in the next lab. Actually, this lab. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing the memory hierarchy, you can add prefetchers into that. OK. This is actually a very fascinating topic. Prefetching has been used in many, many places, not only in a chip, but across the system itself. For example, the operating systems that you're using are doing heavy, aggressive prefetching from the file system into the, uh, from the disk or SSD into DRAM. Or they're prefetching what programs you're going to use, perhaps. They're tracking your access patterns and they're trying to open up or at least preload some programs into memory before you even start them. The key is how to do that accurately without losing a lot of performance. And we'll see some of the methods that at least processors use today. But some of those methods are actually applicable to disks as well. For example, disk schedulers, they detect some of the streaming patterns and they, stream, uh, they prefetch data uh, into DRAM uh, if, if such streaming patterns are detected. Or at least a, a page buffer uh, if, if such patterns are detected. OK, I guess before we go on, I have a bunch of announcements. I don't have any office hours today. Uh, but you can reach me via email. We'll schedule something for later. I hope there's nothing urgent that we need to discuss. Uh, uh, I'll talk about graded labs, but homework, your homework is graded too. You can see your grades. And you can find the grade distributions on the website. Uh, they're all uploaded, right? Yes. Uh, lab 6 is due April 20th. You know that. This is memory hierarchy. It should be fun. Homework 6 is due today. Is everybody done with it? Yeah. Homework 7 will be out soon if it's not already out. Uh, it should be out very soon. Yes? So the grades for the homework and the labs are on Blackboard or only the distributions on the website? Oh, I don't. Uh, if they're written on app uploading, they grade, right? Okay. There you go. That's your answer. <laughs> homework 7 will be out soon. It will be due after midterm 2, but please do the homework to prepare for midterm 2. Again, the purpose of the homeworks is mainly to prepare you for uh, exams and I'd like you to do uh, homework two, uh, homework seven for midterm two. And midterm two is coming up April 23rd, which may seem like a long time from now, but start preparing soon. Uh, start preparing now, actually. It's, it's going to be similar in format and spirit to midterm one. Yes? Uh, well, the content on homework seven, uh, is, that, is the content for that still yet to be covered in any of the lectures besides this one? Yeah, some of them will be, like prefetching. Multiprocessing, but we're going to cover prefetching. We're going to cover multiprocessing in the next lecture, but that will be on the exam. So uh, that's why it's we we made homework seven such that the content includes what we will cover next week. Okay, and some of those actually many many of the uh, questions on the homework are from past exams. So try to solve them without looking at the solutions in the past. Okay. Some suggestions for a midterm two. Definitely solve the past midterms and finals on your own. This is the biggest suggestion I can give to you. Uh, time yourself, sit down, dedicate some time, and solve the entire midterm and final. And check your solutions versus the online solutions. Everything is online. And questions will be similar in spirit. And these, are, uh, these websites contain the past exams. Doing homework seven is another suggestion, definitely. Uh, well, I think these are kind of obvious, but study and internalize the lecture material well. Think about the trade-offs uh, and understand them well and do the readings that are required. There are some required readings uh, that I've been giving, so please do that. Okay, moving on to lab four. These are the statistics on lab four. I was actually pretty happy with the scores over here. So if everybody does this, then you'll all get A's, hopefully, going forward in the course. So the median was 96, mean was 91, uh, and the distribution looks like this instead of having stuff around here. That's good. So I'm happy to see this. And I'd like to recognize the extra credit winners. This is based on branch performance. 
And I believe this is the accuracy compared to an ideal predictor. Xiao is the one who actually knows exactly which tests are run. There were uh, across four tests. So Bailey, looks like you've gotten 85% accuracy compared to the ideal. I believe these are hard tests, by the way. These are, that's why these numbers are low. Aaron, uh, Jeremy, I don't know if he's in the back. Chiang, there, and Clement. There you go. Well, congratulations. This is, you'll get extra credit definitely, but this is actually the prize for doing extra. Okay, lab six is memory hierarchy. You already have it out. Uh, this is actually a fun component. Now you'll have a full, hopefully, full enough C-level simulator that contains a memory hierarchy, L2 cache, a reasonable L2 cache, and a reasonable DRAM-based main memory. And definitely follow the specifications. Otherwise, it's, uh, otherwise, it's very difficult for us to grade you if you don't follow the specifications exactly. And in fact, this is, this is kind of how you design systems as well. You come up with some specification uh, and you follow it such that you get it correct, such that you have a golden simulator that you can compare changes to your design with. Right? If you don't have that golden simulator correct, it's very difficult to understand what uh, what changes, how, how changes you make affect performance or energy or something else that you're evaluating. An extra credit is prefetching, which is a subject of this lecture. Basically, we'd like you to design your own hardware prefetcher to improve system performance. And we'll cover some of those interesting beasts soon. Yes? What point is it Sunday? April, yes, it is a Sunday. Oh, it just says due Wednesday. Say it again? It just says due Wednesday. Not there. Oh. Oh yeah, that's right. Thanks. <laughs> so this was, uh, I don't know why it says due Wednesday. Was it? I thought it was due Friday. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Anyway. <laughs> it's, it's probably b a copy paste there from somewhere else. <laughs> oh, it's, there you go. Now this is, this is a processing error, I think, here. <laughs> Let's see. I cannot blame PowerPoint for writing Friday, right? <laughs> All right, that was a processing error. Now if you, we fix it, hopefully. Let's see if it's still good. There you go, you Sunday. <laughs> okay, so last lecture we started covering memory latency tolerance mechanisms, and we covered run execution execution as enhancements, a way of efficiently enhancing out of order executions performance and tolerating memory latencies. Looked another way, run execution execution is really a prefetching mechanism, right? Whenever you get a uh, long latency cache miss at the head of the reorder buffer, you start the speculative execution mode that basically aims to prefetch uh, data and instructions on the predicted program path by executing, speculatively executing instructions. It's really a prefetching mechanism. Except prefetching is done by the main program. You checkpoint the architectural state and you keep executing without stalling. It's kind of a nice thread-based or execution-based prefetching mechanism. We'll classify the prefetching mechanism soon. So keep that in mind. And we've also talked about some enhancements to Renet execution, like efficient Renet execution and address value delta prediction. So hopefully you remember that. Uh, so this was a value prediction mechanism that actually is used just in run-ahead mode to enhance the ability to paralyze uh, cache misses. Right. Okay, today we'll talk about the basics of prefetching. I guess we'll talk about some basics, a method for doing prefetching, but we'll also co try to cover advanced prefetching. So I have a lot of slides, so let's see, let's see where we end up. So this is, uh, I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. Basically this was our motivation for tolerating memory latency. This is a modern processor and most of the uh, time it spends waiting for memory on memory intensive workloads. And most of the time, it's actually waiting for long latency cache misses to complete with a small window. And we've talked about four fundamental techniques to tolerate this memory latency or hide this memory latency. You should be familiar with all of them. Caching, prefetching, multi-threading, and out-of-order execution. Today, we'll talk about prefetching in more detail. So what is prefetching? Well, I guess it's an outline of the prefetching lectures. I hope, I hope to eliminate that S from here, prefetching lecture. Uh, since we've already covered run-ahead execution. But why do we prefetch? Why could it, why does it work? There are four questions in prefetching. What to prefetch, when to prefetch, where to prefetch, and how to prefetch. And you can have many different combinations of that. 
And then we'll jump into software prefetching, talk about hardware prefetching and execution prefetching. Talk about prefetching performance in between somewhere over here. Uh, and then talk about prefetch throttling briefly. Uh, we won't get into issues in multi-core probably in this course, but think about what kind of issues you can have with prefetching in multi-core. Because if you generate inaccurate prefetches, you'll, uh, you'll be prefetching data into the, potentially the cache that's shared by other cores. So you could be kicking out some useful blocks from other cores. As well as you could be using ba valuable memory bandwidth, and memory bandwidth becomes even more valuable when you have many, many cores sharing the memory. And if prefetches are useless, then you'd be uh, wasting that useful memory bandwidth. You'd, you'd be wasting memory ca uh, mem uh, cache space and memory bandwidth. So there are a lot of issues in, with prefetching in multi-core. You need to be even more efficient when you have a multi-core system. Actually, this is one of the reasons why prefetching does not work very well in GPUs. Remember the GPUs? They, they, they can execute lots of threads, and memory bandwidth is very, very precious there. And even though the access patterns may be very amenable to prefetching, if you make a mistake, you're wasting that valuable memory bandwidth. And you really don't want to make that mistake because that mistake costs you perhaps an access from another thread that's actually non-speculative, right? That's actually correct. Okay, so we'll probably not get into it, but if you take 742, we'll cover this a lot. Okay, what the idea of prefetching, we've discussed this before, but the idea is to fetch the data before it's needed. Well, data could be instruction in this case also. Uh, basically, prefetch or preload the data. Why memory latency is high? If we can somehow prefetch accurately and early enough, we can reduce and eliminate that latency. Reduce or eliminate that latency. If you cannot eliminate it fully, you can maybe eliminate it halfway, right? With misstatus holding registers, misstatus handling registers, misbuffers. You can uh, wait for that miss to complete. Uh, the big upside is, remember, caching couldn't eliminate compulsory misses. None of the other techniques actually eliminated uh, compulsory misses. Prefetching is the technique that can eliminate compulsory misses. You don't necessarily need to see uh, a miss or a cache block uh, before prefetching it. This depends on your prefetching algorithm, though, as we will see. More questions. Can it eliminate all cache misses? <coughs> Capacity, conflict, compulsory? Maybe. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> I like the answer. It depends. Well, it could, right? Ideally, theoretically, if you could prefetch everything in advance somehow, why not, right? You could eliminate all possible cache misses. It's very difficult to do, of course, but there's no reason why it cannot. Okay? So this involves predicting which address will be needed in the future, obviously. Uh, and it usually works if the programs have predictable missed address patterns. Uh, at least for simple prefetchers. We'll see more sophisticated prefetchers are run ahead execution. Run ahead execution doesn't require this, right? Because it's really pre executing the program. Uh, okay, one thing uh, to uh, be clear on is prefetching doesn't really affect correctness, right? Because it's really predicting an address. And if you have a misprediction in prefetching, meaning if you mispredict an address, if you say, I'm going to use this address soon, but if you're not going to use that address, then that, th that, shouldn't affect perf uh, that shouldn't affect correctness, right? Because the prefetch data at a mispredicted address is simply not used. You can bring it in, uh, or you could, you could generate an address that caused a TLB miss. You may decide not to handle it, right? Many processors actually do not handle it. You can generate an address that caused a page fault. Again, many processors do not handle that page fault because it's all speculative. You could choose to speculatively handle the page fault, but that leads to other system design issues that uh, need to be handled, right? So there's no need for state recovery in prefetching. This is in contrast to branch misprediction and value misprediction, right? At, at, at least on the correct path. When you're mispredicting a branch, you'd better recover from it. When you're mispredicting a value, you'd better recover from it. Unless you do all of this in, uh, in a really purely speculative mode. When you uh, mispredict a branch, you don't necessarily need to recover from it, right? Same as value misprediction. Okay. Some basics uh, in, in modern systems, when, and for the rest of this lecture, I will talk about prefetching in terms of cache blocks. Prefetching is usually done in cache block granularity. You don't go below that granularity. You could, there's no reason not to, but because modern systems operate based on cache blocks, you prefetch cache blocks. You don't prefetch individual words. But key, uh, having said that, some, some systems can prefetch subblocks, right? If you have a subblock cache, you can certainly prefetch subblocks into the cache. And this, may, this makes sense, especially. Uh, when your different cache levels have different 
size of cache blocks. So for example, your L1 cache can have 16 byte cache blocks. Your L2 cache can have uh, 64 byte cache blocks. And you may be prefetching the sub blocks from your L2 cache into L1. Okay. Uh, prefetching can reduce both miss rate and miss latency. Right. Miss rate if it eliminates a cache miss. Miss latency if it doesn't eliminate the cache miss, but it uh, overlaps. It's uh, the demand comes uh, sometime after the prefetch request is generated, but before the prefetch request is complete. And both can improve performance. Uh, so you don't have to reduce the miss rate with prefetching as long as you reduce miss latency. Okay. It can be done by the hardware compiler programmer, uh, any kind of programmer actually, operating system programmer too. This is just one example of hardware prefetcher. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, the, if you look at this, this shows the caches, I cache, D cache, L2 request queue, L2 cache, bus request queue, and the memory controller and the bus. This is an old system with on-chip, off-chip distinction. Today, most systems have memory controllers on-chip. But this, is, this shows a, a prefetcher that looks at the L2 request stream, L2 access stream, and uh, trains itself by looking at what goes into the L2 accesses, and it also observes what misses in the L2. And when a miss happens in L2, it creates a tracker that tracks what are the accesses that are coming after this, and it j injects prefetches into the prefetch request queue, such that it can prefetch at the L2 level. Basically, this is a prefetcher that sits close to the L2, observes the L2 miss stream uh, to create streams, and then gets trained by the L2 access stream, and then injects prefetches into the L2 level that could actually go uh, all the way to the memory control. This is where a prefetcher could sit in the system. You could actually have the prefetcher anywhere. You could have an iCache prefetcher. You could have a dcache prefetcher. You could have a prefetcher at the memory controller. And uh, where you place the prefetcher determines what kind of access streams you expose the prefetcher to. For example, at the iCache level, you're basically exposing the prefetcher to every cache block access, right? Whereas here, you're exposing the prefetcher to a filtered access stream. It's not seeing the access stream that goes into dcache. It's seeing the access stream that misses in the dcache, right? So it's a filtered access stream. It's not a complete access stream, which means that it may be missing the full information about what accesses the processor is actually doing to the entire memory system. But it may be interesting because it's actually training on the misses that are happening, which is really what you would like to prefetch, right? If everything is sitting in the L1 cache, you don't really care. Right? You don't want to prefetch the next. But if things are missing in the L1 cache, you want to start prefetching. The downside is if you actually miss some information, maybe you, you, you think that the processor is not proceeding, but the processor is actually proceeding here, and you may not have that information to prefetch the next cache block. Okay? We'll get to this uh, in a little bit, but keep that in mind. So the four questions that I promised you earlier is what, when, where, and how. So we'll cover uh, all of these four questions. Uh, so what address to prefetch, when to initiate a prefetch request, where, where to place the prefetch data. So this is kind of assuming that the prefetch data actually goes into the L2 cache, which is how most processors today do hardware prefetching. Uh, and how to do the prefetching, software, hardware, execution-based, or thread-based, or cooperative. So let's start with the what. What addresses do you prefetch? Uh, basically, this is important because prefetching useless data waste resources, right? And there are many resources it wastes. It wastes memory bandwidth, cache or prefetch buffer space, if you're prefetching into a prefetch buffer. It wastes energy consumption. Uh, and these could all be utilized by demand requests or more accurate prefetch requests. That's the trade-off you're making. So it's very important to come up with a prefetch algorithm that uh, figures out this what carefully. Accurate prediction is important, uh, of address is important, and uh, one of the main metrics of prefetchers is prefetch accuracy. This is simply uh, the fraction of used prefetches among all sent prefetches. Simple. And we'll look, talk about some other metrics as well. So how do we know what to prefetch? That's what determines this what. We'd like to predict based on past access patterns. This is one option, especially if you're doing this dynamically. Or use the compiler's knowledge or the programmer's knowledge of the data structures and its access patterns. So we'll take a look at both. And a prefetching algorithm actually determines what to prefetch. And you may have many different prefetching algorithms employed. In fact, modern pr uh, processors have multiple different prefetchers at different levels operating uh, on uh, using different or slightly different algorithms to prefetch different kinds of data. 
On top of that, you have software prefetching algorithms also. The second challenge or question is when to prefetch. When do you initiate a prefetch request? If you actually, let's assume that your address is correct. Uh, you've correctly figured out that you're going to access this address at some point. Uh, if you prefetch that address too early, this may not be a good decision, right? Because you prefetch that address and the data comes into the cache or the prefetch buffer. And by the time it's actually needed by the processor, by the time the processor demands that address, that uh, data is already evicted from the cache or the prefetch buffer. Right? That's the downside of prefetching too early. If you prefetch too late, well, then you may not be able to hide the whole memory latency, right? If you generate a prefetch request one cycle before the processor actually is going to demand it, well, you saved only one cycle. It doesn't help, right? So that's, it's kind of an art to actually prefetch at the appropriate place. Ideally, you would like to pre, uh, you would like the data for the prefetch to return just before, immediately before the first demand access to that data occurs. And that's usually a tough thing to do. Uh, not only in hardware, well, definitely in software, but also in hardware. We'll see why it's a tough thing to do in software. So when a data, uh, when a data item is prefetched, uh, well, the, the timeliness of the prefetch is affected by when to initiate this prefetch request. So uh, we call a prefetcher timely if it actually, timeliness is actually a little bit difficult to quantify, but if it actually generates uh, requests uh, such that the, the prefetch request such that the prefetch data arrives right before the demand accesses it. The prefetcher can be made more timely by tuning its aggressiveness. Right? You can make the prefetcher more aggressive. This way, uh, more aggressive meaning pref you prefetch earlier and earlier, if you will. Uh, you try to stay far ahead of the processor's demand access stream. And here, some visual thinking may help. You could think of a prefetcher going ahead of the access stream of the processor. Let's see which one of these oh. is the right thing to pick. Oh. Well, that doesn't work also. Richardo, we should fix this problem. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can ask Jen to get some more. OK, this looks better, but it's going to die soon. Because it has, I don't know, a blip. <laughs> OK, so processor may be generating accesses, right? Uh, and let's say, let's say it's generating access to address A, A plus 1, A plus 2, A plus 3. Well, I should put it this way, perhaps. If this is time, uh, a, a plus 1, a plus 2, a plus 3, dot, dot, dot. Uh, you would like the prefetcher to be ahead of this in terms of time as, as to when it prefetches uh, these things, right? Prefetcher should be ahead of this, meaning uh, at this point, uh, maybe it should, it should be prefetching a, a plus 1, a plus 2, a plus 3, a plus 4, right? So this is kind of the distance of the prefetcher. I'll define this more formally later. It's kind of ahead of the processor speed. If the pre prefetcher was actually generating A over here, it's too late, right? Because at the same time, processor is also generating A. If the prefetcher is generating A over here, well, it's too late. So you could actually improve. Looks like I have new things here. You could actually improve the aggressiveness of the prefetcher by making it stay farther ahead of the access stream, like this. And we'll see how to do that. You could increase the distance of the prefetcher, or you could increase the degree of the prefetcher, how many prefetches you generate. If you're doing this in hardware. If you're doing prefetching in software, you can move the prefetch instructions earlier in the code. There are special instructions called prefetch instructions to do prefetching, to preload data into the caches, and you can move them earlier in the code. Now this is, a, again, there's a trade-off, right? There's a trade-off whenever you do both of these. If you actually uh, increase the distance of the prefetcher from the processor's access stream, then you may start prefetching too early. Same as here. If you move the prefetch instructions earlier in the code, you may start prefetching too early. You may never even use that data anymore because you move, for example, the prefetch instructions ahead by many branches, right? You may never get to the place where you actually use that data that's prefetched because the prefetch instructions moved much earlier in the code and it was moved above some branches and branches are later executed 
and they determine that you're not going to use this data. So that's the difficulty of software-based prefetching. You need to place the instructions somewhere to do the prefetching, <coughs> except uh, there, there are only so many places you can move the instructions without, uh, without hitting a branch in between. And if you hit a branch, now your control flow path may take you to a place where that prefetch data is never used. So the t uh, by trying to improve timeliness in software, you may reduce accuracy because you send out this prefetch and that's not going to use. Right? It's actually a complex trade-off, timeliness, accuracy, and we'll talk about coverage later on. What fraction of the cache misses you can actually prefetch is the coverage of the prefetcher. And you have a complex trade-off between these three depending on the d design of your prefetching. Okay, let's talk about the third question, which is where. Where do you actually place the data once you prefetch it? Uh, well, there are two major options. One is putting it into the cache, and the second is in a separate prefetch buffer. Uh, if you put it into the cache, this is simple, right? Everything else goes into the cache anyway. There's no need to design separate buffers. The downside of this is now you can evict useful demand data. You can cause cache pollutions. Because prefetches could be inaccurate, right, by definition. They're not demanded yet. In a separate prefetch buffer, basically, if you have a separate prefetch buffer sitting somewhere else in your memory hierarchy. Now your demand data is protected from the prefetches, right? There's no cache pollution. At least there's no prefetcher cost cache pollution. Uh, the downside of this prefetch buffer is now your memory system design is more complex, right? You already have many levels of hierarchy. If you add one more prefetch buffer, perhaps at every level or some levels, uh, you need to make the design choice of where do you place the prefetch buffer? When to access the prefetch buffer? Do you do it in parallel or serial with the level of cache you place it at. When do you move the data from the prefetch buffer to cache? A good idea is probably whenever, whenever the processor demands that data, although that's not even clear because it all depends on the reuse patterns of the program, right? Uh, and how do you size the prefetch buffer? If you want your prefetcher to be aggressive going ahead and you would like your prefetcher to be aggressive uh, to be far ahead of the demand stream if your memory latency is high, uh, then <coughs> you may need to prefetch a lot of data, uh, and your prefetch buffer may need to be large. Uh, and keeping the prefetch prefetch buffer coherent is another issue. We haven't covered coherence yet, but we will cover it soon. If you actually have multiple processors accessing the data, if you prefetch some data that's actually going to be used by some other processor, you, uh, or written to by some other processor, you need to keep this coherent. That's having another uh, buffer in the system that you need to keep coherent complicates the design. So because of these complexity reasons, mainly many modern systems place the prefetch data into the cache. Some of them have prefetch buffers at different places, but uh, most of them, whenever they do prefetching into the, uh, into the core or close to the core, they place prefetch data into the cache. And these are some of the systems, and new systems are like that too. The second thing in where, uh, let's assume that you're prefetching into the cache now. Where do you prefetch into the cache? Which cache level do you prefetch to? Again, this is another design choice, right? Uh, do you prefetch from memory to L2, or do you prefetch directly into L1? Well, if you have inclusive caches, when you're prefetching into L1, you're actually prefetching into L2 also, right? But do you place it into L1 or L2 or L3, right? There are advantages and disadvantages associated with this, and I'm sure at this point you can make that trade-off, right? Because if, you, if the prefetch data is going to be used right away, maybe putting it into L1 is a good idea, right? But then L1 is small. You don't want to pollute L1 as much. Uh, and at the L1 level, you can tolerate latency. If you get an L1 cache miss and an L2 cache hit, you can tolerate that with out-of-order execution processor, ass assuming that you have out-of-order execution in your design, right? So maybe prefetching into L2 is not a bad idea. That way, you don't pollute your uh, cache that has very precious space. But you prefetch, uh, you, you pollute the cache, you potentially pollute the cache uh, uh, that, that has more space. Uh, and if you prefetch into L1, the, the data may not stay there for long, right? Because it's a small cache. You may want to keep it there. Uh, you may want to prefetch the data into L, L2 such that the data that's prefetched stays there long. So there are a bunch of advances and disadvantages associated with this. And it's a complex trade off, again, depending on when the data patterns are used. But usually, many modern systems prefetch from memory to L2 or at the uh, lower level cache. They don't directly prefetch into the L1. Why? Because L1 is small, you don't want to pollute it. And the second is, L1 cache misses you can tolerate without order execution. 
if you have out order execution. Whereas L3 caches are difficult to tolerate because they have much longer latencies. Uh, so uh, there, there also there could be separate prefetchers between different levels also from L2 to L1. Actually, Intel has prefetchers at multiple levels, uh, and I believe they have an L2 to L1 prefetcher also that operates in a diff with different uh, uh, with a different design and with different knobs because the latencies are very different between L1 to L2, right? Whereas the latencies between L2 to memory or L2 to the L3 are very different too. So keep these in mind. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover all of these design decisions, but there are many design decisions that go into this. And the last thing in where is once you decide which level of data uh, of cache you prefetch into, where do you place the data, prefetch data in that cache? Right? In other words, do you treat the prefetch blocks the same as demand fetch blocks? Do you use the same insertion and replacement policy? Remember the replacement and insertion policies we've discussed? Uh, well, why, why, do we, why do we make that distinction, or why do we even want to make that distinction? Prefetch blocks are not known to be needed, where demand blocks are known to be needed, right? If you have an LRU policy, least recently used policy, a demand block is placed into the MRU position, most recently used policy. But by definition, you're not, uh, when you prefetch a block, you haven't even used it yet, right? It's just a prefetch block. So do you want to follow the same policy and place the prefetch block into the MRU position? Well. Actually, there are many processors that do that. Not today, that have done that before. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure there are some processors that do that today too, but they're becoming a lot more intelligent in the management of the cache. Even demand requests are not placed in the MRU position today. Uh, they, uh, they, they want some more evidence as to whether uh, the demand is actually reused. But we're not gonna go into that. Again, you can take 742 if you wanna see the more sophisticated policies. Or do we skew the replacement policy such that it favors the demand fetch block somehow? Uh, one of the old HP processors actually prefetched data into the LRU position in a way. Basically, they never, uh, let's say, I don't remember how many ways of cache they had. I believe it was four ways or eight ways. But prefetches only went to one way, which is the LRU way for that particular set. That way, you don't disturb all of those other seven ways. Those are reserved for demands. But the LRU way is used, shared between demands, demand data, and prefetch data. Make sense? This way you contain the damage prefetches can do. The downside, there's a downside to this also. Now you're re reducing the amount of space prefetches can have in your cache, right? So it's a trade-off. Prefetches don't not only do damage, they also do a lot of good. So if you're, they're doing a lot of good, reducing the space they can have in the cache may not be a good idea. Okay. That's interesting. It's, this, is, this is where a lot of trade-offs uh, trade become complicated. There's another form of where, not in terms of uh, where to place the data that you prefetch, but where do you place the hardware prefetcher in the memory hierarchy? Uh, in other words, well, this is what we've discussed earlier when I showed you that picture, right? What access patterns does the prefetcher see? What access patterns does it get trained on and does it capture and does it try to predict? Uh, you can have the prefetcher at the level where you're actually generating accesses, all L1 hits and misses. Uh, you could have the prefetcher at the L2 level, which sees only L1 misses. And you could have the prefetcher at the L3 level, uh, or after L2 level, which sees only L2 misses. Now as you go down or up the levels, the amount of information that the prefetcher is exposed to reduces because accesses get filtered as you go up the levels, right? Up in terms of the numbers. Uh, Whereas uh, if you're exposed to all of these accesses, maybe you have a much more complete access pattern. Seeing a complete access pattern leads to potentially better accuracy in prefetching because you don't have gaps. For example, if you, th this may be the complete access pattern. You're accessing cache block A, A plus one, A plus two, A plus three uh, at the L1 level. But at the L2 level, if you look at the access pattern, maybe you see A, A plus three, A plus uh, five, a plus eight, dot, dot, dot. Why? Because some of the accesses may be filtered, right? Because some of them may hit in the cache. They, they just remain in the cache for some reason. Maybe because they were prefetched a long time ago. Maybe they were reused for some reason. And now you're seeing this access pattern that has no pattern to it, at least no discernible pattern, easily discernible pattern. The stride here is three, and then you have two, and then you have plus three again. Whereas here, it's clear that you're doing plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, right? 
So that's the downside of not seeing a more comp complete access pattern. You can get better accuracy with a more complete access pattern and better coverage also. We haven't defined coverage, but I've briefly talked about it. Basically, it's the fraction of cache misses that are prefetched uh, or eliminated or partially eliminated. The downside of seeing a more complete access pattern is basically because you're exposed to it, you need to handle it. Right? There, there's a lot more accesses. There are a lot more accesses that happen as L1 hits and misses than L2 misses only. And as, as a result, the prefetcher needs to examine more requests, which means that it needs to keep up with those requests. This is more bandwidth intensive. Maybe you need more ports into the prefetcher to prefetch, to do better prefetching. Right. So that's another uh, dimension of where. So let's go into how uh, a little bit. Uh, so uh, how actually is, opens up another uh, design space Basically, you could do all of this in software, hardware, or execution-based, or some, some cooperative manner also. Uh, when you do this in software, ISA needs to provide some prefetch instructions, and we'll see some of these. And somebody, programmer or the compiler, needs to insert prefetch instructions, which means that they need to spend effort into pre uh, doing this. And usually, this works well only for regular access patterns. Because you can imagine, uh, it's difficult to place this instruction such that you prefetch, uh, your prefetch finishes at the right time, right? Because you're dealing with time, and time is not something that you can easily measure as a programmer, right? And it's really dependent on how long your access latencies are. You're writing this program, inserting prefetch instructions. You would like to know how long this access latency is. But that's dependent on many, many things, right? That's dependent on what microarchitecture your program will run on. You may write an x86 program that will run on an AMD processor versus an Intel processor, and their access latencies may be totally different. So how do you place the prefetch instructions? This is where uh, the optimization that's specific to processor can help. But if you optimize code specifically to a processor, it may not get good performance on some other processor. So software prefetching is difficult even for regular access patterns because regular access patterns depend on time also. And this is made even more complicated if you are running multiple programs on the same chip, right? You optimize your program assuming some access latency and assuming some cache space, cache behavior. It's running together with some other program that's not changing those access latencies because the memory control is prioritizing one of these programs over the others in ways that cannot be possibly predicted at, the compi at compile time, right? So that's the difficulty of software-based prefetching methods, at least compile time prefetching methods. The hardware prefetching methods in this case, it's more dynamic. Hardware monitors the processor accesses and somehow memorizes or finds patterns or strides and generates prefetch addresses automatically. This is more adaptive now because now hardware is monitoring the access patterns and it's, uh, as, as they happen in time. Right? Now it can adapt its timeliness to, uh, to the feedback that's happening in the process. So we'll take a look at that. And the last one is execution-based prefetchers. This could be either hardware or software, actually cooperative in general, uh, somebody generates a thread that's executed the prefetch data for the main program. We've talked about this briefly last time, right, when we talked about run-ahead execution. You write a thread, and the sole purpose of that thread is to prefetch for the main program. And this thread can run on another thread context in a multi-thread processor or another core. And there are many options, as we will see later on. This thread can be generated by either the software, programmer, or the hardware. In general, it's difficult to generate this thread in hardware. But if you think about it, run execution kind of does this, right? It's using the main program thread in hardware as an execution-based prefetcher when the main program actually stalls, except it's not doing it on a separate thread context. OK? So hopefully, this gives you a lay of the land of prefetching. Now, we'll, go, we'll jump into some of the methods for prefetching. Any questions so far? No? Everybody is bored or excited? OK. Everybody's, a lot of people are paying attention. So I'm taking that as excited. <laughs> yeah. This has been a fascinating topic for many people. And there's still, there's still a lot more improvements to be done in this area. OK. Let's talk about software prefetching a little bit. Uh, the, remember, the idea was compiler or programmer places prefetch instructions to appropriate places in code such that you don't later stall for loads or demands. And one of the papers, early papers that described this was written actually by Todd Murray in the CS department. I'd recommend that you read that. 
It was an ASPLOS, Architectural Support for Programming Language and Operating System, 1992. Uh, basically, prefetch instructions prefetch data into caches. It doesn't need to be the case, but that's the simplest way of doing this. And a compiler or programmer can insert such instructions into the program. And I'll show you examples. Many, many ISAs today have this kind of instructions. These are ins uh, examples from the x86. x86 has a prefetch instruction uh, with different flavors. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll give you this. This may be an old specification, so this may have changed. But this is from one version of the x86 uh, manual. If you look at this, it says uh, prefetch t0. Fetch is a line of data from memory that contains a byte specified with the source operand to a location in the cache hierarchy specified by a locality hint. So these instructions are distinguished based on the locality hints. T0, T1, T2, TA. Uh, T0, temporal data. Temporal data means it's expected that this data will be reused. Prefetch data into all levels of the cache hierarchy. You want to keep that data around. And prefetching all, into all levels is useful. Uh, in Pentium 3 processor, first or second level cache. Pentium 4 and Intel Xeon processor, second level cache. Well, they've just violated the old levels of the cache hierarchy definition, right? It doesn't go into the first level cache because of what I said earlier. It's a good trade-off to actually not prefetch the data into the first level cache because it's small and you don't want to pollute it, and you can tolerate the latency of the first level cache. So even the specification is microarchitecture dependent. If you look at T2, temporal data with, res with respect to second level cache, basically, you, uh, th if the programmer specifies this, it means that you, uh, if you prefetch this data into L1, it will not be used before it's evicted from L L1 cache. That's why I prefetch into the L2 cache. So again, these, uh, there's microarchitecture dependent specification of this. But there's also one more thing over here, non-temporal data with respect to all cache levels. Uh, this says the data is going to be perhaps touched, one, touched once, but never going to be reused again. So if you're streaming through memory and never going to retouch uh, that data, this may be a good idea. For example, if you're doing A, A plus one, A plus two, dot, 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 A plus a billion, and never going to reuse anything again, this may be a good idea. Or if your reuse distance is so large uh, for a block that uh, you, don't, you should not keep it in the cache, other, it's going to be evicted in the cache anyway, you may want to use this instruction, non-temporal prefetch. And here what the... Mm, uh, what, what the processor does is it basically places the instruction into one level of the cache into a location close to the processor and not to any other level and minimizes the cache pollution that way. Make sense? So streaming is actually an interesting pattern. If, you, if a lot of what you're doing is streaming, uh, you may not even want to cache, right? If all you're doing is streaming through memory, a cache is useless because you're never going to reuse a data, uh, an address that you've accessed. So it's, it's good to think about the benefit of caches when you're, when you're streaming. And people have proposed not using caches at all when you're streaming. You can detect the streams and somehow place the data into stream buffers, as we will see later on, and not pollute the main caches. Main caches are very good if you have good locality, but if you have streaming accesses which you will never return to, you don't have good locality. So you may handle them in a much more efficient way with just these prefetch instructions. Okay. So let's take a look at how these are useful, potentially. So this can, actually software prefetching can work for very regular array-based access patterns. And this is one example ex access pattern where it works. Uh, basically, you're going through this array, you're summing AI, uh, well, I guess you're multiplying AI and BI and you're accumulating into a sum. I guess a dot product could work this way, right? Uh, while you're doing the sum, you're prefetching eight iterations ahead, right? These prefetch instructions, th by the way, these prefetch instructions are non-blocking. What they should not do is stall the processor. If you stall the processor here, well, it's kind of bad, right? <laughs> You'll not wait for, wait for the prefetch instructions. They should just issue the prefetch and get out of the machine, okay? And misstatus handling registers help that because now you can have multiple requests that are outstanding. So in this case, you're prefetching eight iterations ahead. And one of the issues is, well, I guess there are several issues. Let's start with one of them. If you have prefetch instructions, now they're taking up processing and execution bandwidth, right? They need to be executed. And your code size has increased. Uh, the second is, this was what I was going to say first. This is actually an even bigger difficulty. How early to prefetch? Determining this is difficult. Do you prefetch eight iterations ahead like this? Or do you prefetch 16 iterations ahead? 
Or do you prefetch two iterations ahead? Now that depends on many things. Uh, whether you're going to get cache misses is one thing. Like which access are going to get cache misses? Uh, how long is your memory access latency? And how much time does it take to execute everything else in this iteration, right? Because what you're really doing is overlapping the memory access latency with some number of iterations. In this case, the hope is that you're doing all of these sums. And by the time you get to the eighth iteration, the data that you started, the prefetches that you've started eight iterations ago are done. Which means that the latency it takes to get to the eighth iteration is similar to the latency it takes to service these requests. Make sense? And that's a difficult balance for the compiler to determine and the programmer to determine because that's dependent on many, many things, right? Cache size, uh, how long it takes to execute this, how long is your memory latency? Yes. But the hardware would know some of that stuff. The issue is the compiler doesn't know it, right? So exactly. what if you did something that's kind of like in the middle mm -hmm. and you're like, hey, you know, we are, like, this is an array that we're going to traverse and like, this is the data size, right? And then based on that, you can like update the trainer without any training and then kind of improve it that way without being so literal. I see. So w w you're, you're thinking of dynamically modifying the code? No, perhaps, no, 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 right? no. Oh. Like, the code has more of a hint instead of just I a very see. literal fetch yes. that address. Uh -huh. Yes. And then with the hints, then because the hardware knows how much mm -hmm. cache it has and all that stuff, it can actually do the uh -huh. appropriate prefetch. So that's, uh, that's actually a good point. Yes, you could, you could potentially do that. People have proposed things like that. Compiler basically specifies the access patterns yeah, exactly. uh, potentially as hints and perhaps specifies what's going on in the iteration a little bit. And the hardware determines when to prefetch. That's more of a hardware software cooperative approach. And that's a very good idea, I think. Except it's not done in today's processors. Well, there are some hints, but not, not like that. <laughs> okay, so this is the most literal way. But this is a difficult thing to do. And if you, once you optimize your program uh, for one machine, it's difficult. Uh, well, it may not get good performance on some other machine because it's constant, maybe different for that machine, right? Okay, even within the same machine, it depends on your core runners, right? Okay, uh, well, I guess we've discussed this already. So your code becomes less portable in terms of performance once you optimize your code this way. And going too far back in code actually reduces accuracy. In this case, it may not be a problem. Well, what happens if you go out of bounds with these prefetch requests? Well, in that case, actually, what, uh, what happens is these prefetch requests are dropped. So the hardware, uh, actually, hardware has, uh, whenever you inject the, in, insert these prefetch instructions, never trust the hardware because they, the hardware actually uh, and the underlying implementation may drop those prefetch instructions, right? These are not required, remember? And hardware designer can make the trade-off that, oh, there are lots of demands into coming into my memory controller or prefetch request queue or request queue. Which one should I drop? Well, prefetch is not necessary. A demand is necessary, so I'm gonna drop the prefetch, which may not be the good choice, which may not be the best choice for performance overall, but that's the easy choice. So uh, here you may have the question, what if you go out of bounds and generate some garbage address that causes an exception? Well, those are dropped. Okay, but, but going too far back in code reduces accuracy as well. So if you want to actually prefetch uh, for some of these iterations, you may go back over here and then uh, put the prefetch instructions beforehand, especially for the first iterations, first eight iterations, if you will. Then you may uh, encounter some branches over here and you, you prefetch for first eight iterations, and then branch takes you away from the for loop. Well, you prefetch some useless data in that case, right? So the, uh, do you actually need prefetch instructions in the ISA? Well, something needs to do, uh, be interpreted as prefetch instructions. In alpha, uh, they had a clever trick. Load into register 31 was treated as a prefetch. So they didn't need to add a special opcode, because register 31 was always hardwired to zero in alpha. It was a zero register. In other ISAs, you actually have prefetch instructions, as we've seen with x86, right? You have the prefetch instruction. PowerPC has the data cache block touch instruction, which is essentially a prefetch instruction. Touch this data cache block, right? It's kind of a literally named instruction. Uh, and uh, there, there are a lot of issues that we can discuss over here, which could actually take up a couple of lectures, but I'm not going to do that. I'll end up with saying that this is actually not easy to do for all access patterns. Now this was a very regular access pattern. Even if you have some irregularity, uh, like else's and if's over here, it becomes uh, prefetching accuracy goes down. But what about something like this? If you have a pointer-based data structure, 
you're currently working on this node. Can you prefetch the next node? Well, yes. Depends on what? How much work you're doing, right, in between. Yes. Well, you could do that, right? Well, this is what, what this is really doing is prefetching the next node and trying to overlap that prefetch with the work. And if this work is large enough that it can cover the latency of the prefetch, that's good. You prefetch for the next iteration. But if, what if this work is really s short, which is usually the case in many traversals? Well, then you really want to do this, right? But now you have a problem here, right? <laughs> Now, I, I've given you the pseudocode of this, obviously. You have a problem because all of these are dependent, right? If all of those are misses, you, you're back to square one here. I mean, which one is, uh, the, the question asks, which one is better here? That's kind of a trick question, if you will. Yes? Also, in the case of the third one, huh? I feel like if any of those were uh, like big faults, then yes. normally the prefetch instruction would be okay with that. Uh -huh. But if you actually have to access the next one, then. That's right. Exactly, yes. So uh, I'm assuming that the, uh, this is all uh, treated as prefetch semantics. So whenever you get a page fault, you just ignore it. Or whenever you have a null pointer to reference, which could also happen here, you just ignore it because it's generated by a prefetch instruction. But yes, that's one of the things. The other thing is uh, you cannot do this, right? Basically, what you're doing is you're doing all of the stalling here. Because if you actually need to generate p next next, you first need to wait for p next. Which means that you need to actually stall. And if you actually want to generate p next next next, you actually need to p, uh, first wait for p next next, and then p, well, first p, uh, wait for p next, and then p next next, and then generate p next. So this doesn't work, right, for uh, pointer-based data structures. People have developed other mechanisms to prefetch for pointer-based data structures, but this simple mechanism doesn't work. Actually, this is a, a very interesting research problem, a difficult problem too. How do you actually generate uh, prefetches for pointer-based data structures? We'll see some solutions to that soon. It's a tough problem. It's one of the toughest problems in my opinion. Uh, well, I guess we are not done with the software prefetching. Where should a compiler insert prefetches? Uh, insert prefetch instructions, I should say. Uh, do you prefetch for every load access, for example? That's another problem at the compiler level. This is too bandwidth intensive, and not every load misses in the cache. So you ideally want to figure out which loads are going to miss in the cache and insert prefetch instructions for that. So you don't want to do this. Uh, ideally, you would like to do something like this. Figure out which loads are likely to miss. Now, this depends on how good your profiling is, right? We're back to the input set representativeness problem that we had with branches. You'd like, uh, what if, uh, you're, uh, with this input set, you see this load missing a lot, but with some other input set, this load misses zero amount of time. In that case, you're inserting prefetch instru instructions that are going to be useless. And that wastes resources. And this is the other issue that we've talked about. How far ahead before the miss should the prefetch be inserted? Again, you can profile and determine the probability of use for various prefetch distances. Prefetch distance means how far ahead you raise the prefetch Inject the, insert the prefetch instruction from the original demand. So I guess one thing you could do in the previous loop is uh, you could do profiling. Uh, you could remember it was this for loop uh, less than n i plus plus, and we had these prefetch instructions and that did uh, I guess i plus eight in that case, but let, let me call it i plus n, and then you have something else. Basically. You profile for different values of n and look at the performance of the program with uh, some representative input set. And then determine n based on profiling, uh, based on the best result of n. That could be one way of doing this. Now again, you're back to the profile input set uh, representativeness problem. If your profile input set is not representative of what you're going to really run this program with, well, good luck. Uh, you, you've set your n, except your n may lead to performance loss. This could actually lead to performance loss, right? If you uh, inject prefetch instructions that are never going to be generating timely requests or correct, uh, accurate requests, you may lo lose performance because now you're executing more instructions and your code size increases. 
So usually you need to insert a prefetch far in advance to cover hundreds of cycles of main memory latency. Because prefetching is actually especially beneficial when you cover the long latency. But it's especially more difficult to cover that latency because injecting this, uh, inserting this prefetch instruction far in advance leads to reduced accuracy. OK. Any questions? OK. So many, many compilers today actually do prefetching. So if you compile your code with GCC uh, with some optimization level, I don't remember what optimization level, it can inject, insert prefetch instructions, assuming you have array-based code. And I'd encourage you to try that. I don't know if it inserts uh, prefetch instructions for pointer-based code. Maybe you can try it and let me know. My guess is not. OK, so let's take a look at hardware prefetching. Uh, the idea here is uh, you have specialized hardware that observes load store access patterns and prefetches data based on that past access behavior. Now, there are trade-offs here. The upside of this compared to software prefetching is now you can tune this to the implementation of the system, right? Because you're designing the, uh, the architect is designing the hardware, architect is designing the memory hierarchy. They're also designing the prefetcher. They know all the latencies and they can adapt the prefetcher to do the best based on what they think is the best. The other upside is it doesn't waste instruction execution bandwidth. You don't need special instructions, or you don't need to add instructions, right? But it can still waste other resources, as we've discussed. The downside is now you have more hardware complexity to detect patterns, right? In some cases, software can be more efficient, especially in array uh, accesses. So let's take a look at a bunch of different hardware prefetchers. The simplest one is next line prefetcher, or next block prefetcher. In this case, uh, the idea is to always prefetch next and cache lines after a demand access or a demand miss. So if you get a cache miss, let's prefetch the next and cache lines as well. Let's call the next line prefetcher or next sequential prefetcher. Uh, this is simple to implement, obviously. No need for sophisticated pattern detection. It works well for sequential or streaming access patterns. Instructions is a good example of this, right? Actually, many instruction prefetchers used to be next line prefetchers. Uh, the downside is it can waste bandwidth with irregular patterns. In fact, it can waste bandwidth with regular patterns also. For example, if you have an access stride of two, and if your n is one, what's your accuracy? Zero, right? You're always prefetching the line that you're not going to use. <laughs> if your access stride is two, and if your n is two, your accuracy is 50%. You're using one out of the two cache lines that you're prefetching. And as your stride grows, this becomes uh, much less efficient. Well, there's a slight issue over here. What if the program is traversing memory from higher to lower addresses? Right? This is kind of assuming that it's uh, traversing from lower to higher addresses. Well, maybe you want to prefetch previous end cache lines too. Or you want to be a little bit smart. You want to at least figure out the direction where the program is moving, plus or minus, and do a next line prefetching or next end line prefetching, uh, plus or minus, depending on the figured out direction. So you can imagine hardware that figures out that direction, right? It just needs to look at two accesses uh, to figure out where, which direction the processor access pattern is moving. OK? This makes sense, right? OK, let's try to be more sophisticated, uh, build prefetchers that are a little bit more intelligent than this. So many programs have striding behavior for good reason, because they have regular accesses. Uh, and strike prefetchers try to latch onto that behavior. Uh, actually, this next line prefetcher is kind of trying to do the same thing, except it's not intelligent enough to figure out what, are the, what is the distance between different accesses. Uh, th there could be two kinds. You could have an instruction program counter based prefetcher or a cache block address based prefetcher. So the idea here, let's take a look at the instruction base. This way, you can have uh, different instructions can lead to different uh, accesses with different strides. Right? Now you can capture those differently. You can record the, uh, the idea is to record the distance between the memory addresses referenced by a load instruction called the stride of the load. We've talked about stride before. As well as the last address referenced by the load. And next time the same load instruction is fetched, prefetch the last address plus stride. That's your next address to prefetch. Make sense? This is assuming that the load is actually generating addresses in a strided manner. So if the load is doing address m in one instance, address m plus 5, m plus 10, m plus 15, dot, dot, dot. You record the stride by looking at just two accesses. Stride is 5 here. And then the when you see the next access, 
you basically add 5 to it and prefetch m plus 10. Well, I guess you cannot do it over here. Uh, well, you could do it over here, right? You actually executed load once, and the second time you execute the load, you get m plus 5. Now you figured out the sprite, and you record the last address you, you fetched, m plus 5. The next time you see the load, when the load is fetched, before it is actually decoded, you can index into this table based on the program counter and actually get the stride and the last address and you can issue a prefetch for m plus 10. And hopefully by the time the load executes the data cache stage, you get the data in the cache. Well, there's a problem with that, right? Anybody can think of the problem? So you're actually generating the prefetch when you're fetching the load. And the data is needed when the load is executed. Maybe too late to do this, right? Your prefetch may be too late. Because in modern machines, the load gets to the execution state pretty quickly, unless it's dependent on some other instructions, right? So this could be beneficial if you uh, cannot. Basically, this could be very beneficial if you have the, you know, the time you actually uh, execute the load uh, is longer than uh, the time it takes. Uh, well, the time between the execution of the load and the fetch of the load is longer than the time it takes to fetch this data. But usually that's not the case. Usually what, what, uh, what happens is you will need to prefetch much further ahead. So this is actually whatever I showed you here, but this puts a little bit more meat to it. Whenever you fetch the load, you use a program counter to index into this table, which basically has a tag, the last address the load referenced, and the stride. And you can have a confidence value with the stride also. For example, if the load Maybe you, want, you may want to see the stride of five twice in a row to say, okay, there's a stride here. Maybe you may want to see the stride of five five times in a row to say that you're confident. So the problem is, how far can this get ahead? Much of, how much of the mislatency can the prefetch cover? I'll give you the answer. Uh, so initiating the prefetch when the load is just fetched, the next time can be too late because the load will access the data cache soon after it's fetched. Uh, there, may be, there, there have been multiple solutions developed for this. One solution, let's look at this prefetch ahead solution. Basically, instead of prefetching last address plus strite, you prefetch for last address plus n times a strite, where n is some distance, if you will. So basically, instead of prefetching m plus 10 over here, you prefetch for m plus, let's say, 5 plus 5, which is m plus 25. So hopefully, by the time the processor gets to m plus 25, you actually get a hit. Initially, you may get some misses over here, but over time, if the access pattern continues, you'll get lots of hits. So this is one way of getting ahead. And you can actually generate multiple prefetches also to get ahead. And as you become more confident, maybe you generate more prefetches. The other solution which is interesting that people have used is you can generate the PC in a look-ahead manner uh, to index the prefetcher table. You don't use the current PC that you're really fetching from, but you're looking ahead. And uh, I'll, I'll give you uh, the idea of one design that can achieve this, but I won't go into detail. But many processors actually decouple the front end and the back end today. So front end is you have the iCache, you have the branch predictor, or let me call it the next fetch address engine. You determine the next fetch address, and you have the program counter, and then this is what you do. And then you generate uh, instructions, and maybe you decode them, and then uh, you have a long queue over here. Let's call the decoded instruction queue. And you fill this queue. And then the rest is the back end, let's say, whatever else you do with the instructions. This is the front end. This is the back end. You can run this front end independently of the back end. As a result, this, these instructions may queue up. And what may happen is now you have kind of a look ahead PC over here, right? your PC is really going further, uh, much further than your backend because you have this huge queue that can accumulate instructions. Assuming that you can keep this queue full, now what you're really doing is by the time this instruction uh, that you fetched for, prefetched for, gets to the end of the queue, hopefully the data has already arrived. Make sense? Okay. You don't even need to decode this, actually. Some other processors, what they do is they have a queue over here. Uh, 
and maybe that you, you don't have the queue over here such that you don't stall. You wait for the decoding until uh, you figure out the instructions that are on the uh, correct path. OK. Does this make sense? Let me, uh, look, uh, let me give you another example of this, uh, and then we'll take a break before we go into more sophisticated prefetches. So this was uh, trying to do the prefetching based on instruction program counter address, right? You have a different stripe for different program counters, which may be a good thing. You could have something different. Based on a block address, you can de detect strikes, right? Uh, because it may so happen that an instruction may not have strikes, but if you look at the aggregate stream of accesses coming from all of the instructions, you may have strikes. You may be accessing address A, address A plus 7, well, address A plus 2, address A plus 4, address A plus 6, dot, dot, dot. And these may be generated by different instructions. Instruction at PC1, PC2, PC3, PC1, and in some manner, right? Maybe PC4, or maybe, maybe in some irregular manner. So you may end up getting a stride based on the acts of different instructions. In this case, it makes sense to monitor the memory addresses and detect strides in the memory addresses. And many modern prefetchers actually work this way because this way they can get around these problems. This way you're not dependent on the instruction. So basically what they do is they uh, look at a chunk of memory and they try to detect the stride within that chunk. Maybe it could be a page, for example. This could be the page address. Actually, I should call it the page address. Uh, within this page, what is the stride? Basically, you need to keep track of what is the last address you've accessed and what is the stride within that page. And if another request comes to the same page, well, you generate a request for the next address that you think is going to be accessed. Does that make sense? OK. So stream buffers are a special case of the cache block address based uh, stride prefetching where n is equal to 1. Basically, here you can have arbitrary strides, but people have proposed what is called stream buffers that just do streaming. You always prefetch the next cache block that looks like this. So I, I have assigned a, a paper. You know, you're not actually required to read it, but I'll give you the idea of stream buffers. So this is the idea of stream buffers. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is you have these buffers, PIFO buffers, that keep data uh, and addresses of different streams. This could be a stream that's starting at address A, address B, address C, address D. Imagine you're adding two vectors. One starting at address A, the other starting at address B. Totally different addresses. And if you're doing this, you need the cache blocks uh, starting, uh, the first cache block, the second cache block, the third cache block, dot, 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 uh, for uh, addresses starting at address A. And the, similarly, for addresses starting at address B. Basically, you're streaming these vectors from memory into the processor. And the idea of a stream buffer is to do exactly that. Each stream buffer holds one stream of sequentially prefetched cache lines. In this case, I believe it's eight over here. So if you have a load, load miss over here, you check the head of the stream buffers for an address match. Let's say you have a load miss on address A. Uh, you check the stream buffers for an address match. If it matches here, basically, you get the data from there. You pop the entry from this FIFO, update the cache with the data. And if, no, if there's no match, you allocate a new stream buffer to the new miss address. And you may have to deallocate one of these streams if they're all being used. Uh, and you could, uh, once you pop off an address or a an address and data, a cache block from the stream buffer, the stream buffer now demands the next address. But let's say you popped off address A. The stream buffer demands address A plus 8 from memory. That way you keep the stream buffer full. And uh, that subsequent cache line is fetched when there's room in the stream buffer and the bus is not busy. Make sense? So if you're streaming through, let's say if you, if you have eight arrays, and if you have eight of these stream buffers, this is a beautiful architecture to add those eight arrays together. Right? Again, it's, it works for access patterns that just fit the structure, which is streaming uh, with uh, a stride of one. And I'll not go into this. This is actually in the paper. I don't know if I actually showed the paper address, but maybe I should show this. This is actually the same paper as the victim cache paper. Remember the victim cache idea that we've discussed? The same paper introduced not only victim caches, but also stream buffers. Okay. Okay. Uh, basically, this is, a, this is actually a very simple hardware. Uh, you just need to store the next address and increment it to generate the prefetch address. 
and you have to store a bunch of cache blocks in the stream. And whenever the CPU actually, actually ad accesses the stream buffer, it compares the top address to its own address. If it's a match, that's great. And this is multiple stream buffers. You can see that. OK. I think this may be a good time to take a break. Let's take a break for five minutes, and we'll continue with uh, prefetcher performance. And we'll get back at 1.48. All right, let's get started. We have a lot to cover. OK, we've actually kind of defined some of these, but I'll uh, define these a little bit more formally. Uh, Prefetcher performance, eventually, in the end, what you really care about is execution time, right? That's really the final metric of performance. But to understand and analyze things a little bit easier, uh, there are a bunch of things that contribute to execution time uh, when you have a prefetcher. And three major metrics are accuracy, coverage, and timeliness. Accuracy, we want to talk about. This is the fraction of used prefetchers among all prefetchers that the prefetcher generates. Coverage, what fraction of all of the misses are prefetched correctly by uh, the prefetcher. Timeliness, this is the fraction of on-time prefetches divided by used prefetches. And on-time, again, is a fluffy concept, right? Because you may be too early. You may be a little bit late, but it's okay, you're prefetching, right? So this is uh, a little bit difficult to evaluate, and that this depends on your definition. You could potentially say, I'm going to count only those prefetches that are in the cache uh, when they're used as on time. Now, that's a strict definition of on time. Time, because you may actually uh, cover some amount of latency with other prefetches, even though the prefetch data may not be in the cache by the time you actually really need it. So it's good to be careful in the timeless definition. And there's no agreed upon timeless definition anyway. But this is all to understand how the prefetcher behaves anyway. The, second, uh, the third is bandwidth consumption. This is uh, basically memory bandwidth consumed with the prefetcher divided by without the prefetcher, that without the prefetcher. This is the increase in bandwidth consumption. Uh, some of the good news is you can actually utilize idle bus bandwidth if it's available. So consuming more bandwidth doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily degrading performance. Well, if your bus bandwidth is your main bottleneck, then it's a bad idea to consume more, right? Because this actually degrades your energy consumption also. And also, it could cause interference to other applications. So ideally, you would like to keep this uh, at one. You don't increase your bandwidth consumption. So you can, you can have a prefetcher that never increases your bandwidth consumption, which means that that prefetcher is either not generating any requests, or all of the requests it's generating is accurate, right? And it's not causing any pollution. So the prefetcher can increase bandwidth consumption because it's generating inaccurate requests or it's causing pollution. OK, you may want to think about that. Ideally, you'd like to design a perfectly accurate prefetcher that shifts your bandwidth consumption such that prefetches consume the uh, bandwidth, and then demand later do not need to require that bandwidth. Cache pollution is another effect. It's a little bit hard to quantify, but does affect performance. This basically extra demand misses due to prefetch placement in the cache. Because you're prefetching, placing prefetches into the cache, you cause extra demand misses. Now there's other things over here, for example, robo for locality, like robo for pollution, that cache uh, prefetcher actually causes. So it's good to think about those too. So prefetcher aggressiveness, what we've discussed earlier, affects all of these performance metrics. And aggressiveness actually is dependent on prefetcher type, basically how early do you generate requests and how many requests do you generate. For most hardware prefetchers, you have two metrics. One is prefetch distance. How far ahead of the demand stream do you get? And the other is prefetch degree. How many prefetches do you generate whenever you see demand access? And as you increase both, you increase the aggressiveness. So let's take a look at this. I've already shown you the access stream of the processor and uh, the prefetch stream as well. But let's assume that the prefetch uh, processor is accessing address x. If the prefetcher is accessing an address that's much further in the predicted stream, then this prefetch stream distance is large. If the prefetcher is accessing another address that's closer to x, then the prefetcher is very conservative in this case. The previous one was very aggressive. Uh, the, this one is very conservative. If the prefetcher is accessing somewhere in between its middle of the road, and this is again very aggressive. If your distance between x and the prefetch address is very large, then you're very aggressive. And increasing that distance makes the prefetcher more aggressive, but it also makes it potentially 
less accurate, right? Because you're prefetching much farther ahead. Maybe the processor is accessing some of them, and then it's going to stop accessing the rest. Right? Maybe it's going to start another uh, speed. Yes. By prefetch degree, do you mean just for a given address, I issue like five prefetches? That's right. Yes. That's what I'm going to discuss next. This was the prefetch distance. Prefetch degree is exactly what you said. Let's say the processor is accessing address x. Prefetcher is over here, at, at, at accessing address p, which is farther from x. Perhaps they access address x plus 1. How many prefetches do you actually generate? Prefetch degree is that. In this case, uh, you have a prefetcher that has a degree of 3, because it generates 3 prefetches after address p. Okay? And as you increase the prefetch degree, again, the prefetcher becomes more aggressive. Okay. So these metrics actually interact. If you have a very aggressive prefetcher, you're well ahead of the load access stream. Right. This is good because it can hide memory access latency better, but it's more speculative also. It can generate requests that are ne never going to be touched. As a result, it can have higher coverage because it's actually generating many, many requests, and better timeliness because it can, have, uh, it can be well ahead of the load access stream. It's getting to those addresses much longer before uh, the processor gets to it, assuming it's accurate. But that was at least the likely lower accuracy. Uh, and higher bandwidth and higher pollution because some of those requests it generates may never be used right? and may actually affect the bandwidth and the uh, caches. If you have a very conservative pre prefetcher, on the other hand, you're now closer to the load access stream. You don't generate, you don't deviate that much. The downside is you may not hide memory access latency completely, as there, but, but the upside is now you reduce potential for cache pollution and bandwidth contention because you're hopefully more accurate by being more conservative. So uh, because you're conservative, you'll likely have higher accuracy. You consume lower bandwidth, and you're less polluting. The downside of this is now you, uh, the prefetcher likely has lower coverage because it doesn't generate as many addresses. And, and it's likely less timely because it's not far ahead of the access stream of the processor. Okay, And you can have many points in between also. So this is one example uh, from the paper that I required you to read, the feedback directed prefetching paper. This is prefetcher accuracy on the x-axis uh, and percentage of Im instructions per cycle improvements over no prefetching. Uh, and uh, this is, these dots over here are the average values that are seen uh, during the execution of different spec benchmarks, spec to CPU 2006, I believe 2006 benchmarks. If you look at this, there is some correlation between prefetcher accuracy and performance improvement or degradation, right? If the prefetcher accuracy is really low for these workloads, you get performance degradation. If the prefetcher accuracy is high, or at least reasonably high, you get performance improvement. But accuracy obviously is not the only determinant, otherwise you would get perfect correlation, right? Here, for example, your accuracy is almost 100%, but you get maybe 5% performance improvement. Here, your uh, accuracy is 100% and you get 150% performance improvement. Why? Maybe this prefetcher is 100% accurate, but it's very conservative, right? Maybe it's not. Uh, well, it's the same prefetcher, but for this workload, it becomes very conservative. For this workload, it may be actually very good, right? It's covering a lot of the cache misses. It's covering a lot of the cache misses for that access pattern. And here, the highest performance improvement actually comes over here, if you look at this. It's about 70% accuracy. But we don't know what the timeliness and the coverage are. And we don't know about all of the other characteristics. Okay? So this is just an indication. So this is uh, one other uh, example of what happens if you actually change, make the prefetcher very conservative, middle of the road, or very aggressive? And you can read the paper that you're assigned to see what are the definitions of these. A a a versus uh, doing no prefetching. These are different spec workloads. This is the geometric mean instructions per cycle uh, for all of those workloads. If you look at this, on average, doing even very conservative pre prefetching buys you a lot of performance. And as you increase the aggressiveness, you get more performance, but the returns are diminishing. But there are some workloads that do not follow this pattern. These workloads, for example, AMMP and Applo, these are actually re have regular access patterns. But it turns out they lose performance as you make the prefetcher very aggressive for the reasons that we've discussed. Uh, in fact, in AMP, you, the performance loss is almost 50%. So you lose half of your performance by making the prefetcher very aggressive. So the goal is to design a mechanism such that you get the best of both worlds. In fact, in Apple, for example, prefetch actually improves performance if you have very conservative, if you have a very conservative design, but if you make it aggressive, you lose performance. So ideally, you would like to get uh, the best 
a kind of distance and degree, conservativeness and aggressiveness, to improve performance. So one idea uh, that's described in the paper that you're reading and that's actually being employed in the processors is to dynamically monitor the metrics of prefetcher performance and throttle the prefetcher aggressiveness up and down based on this past performance metrics. Uh, we're going to talk about these two. But you could also change the location of prefetches uh, in the cache, where you insert the prefetches in the cache based on this past performance as well. Do you insert them at the MRU position? Do you insert them at the LRU position? Do you insert them in the middle such that they don't cause pollution? So let's take a look at some of these decisions. You can read the paper for more detail. But you can classify prefetcher as being highly accurate, mediumly accurate, or low, low accuracy. Uh, and if the prefetcher has high accuracy, it's not late, but it's polluting the cache, you may want to decrease uh, the aggressiveness of the prefetcher. Because it's not late, there's no reason to increase the aggressiveness for that reason. It's highly accurate, well, uh, uh, decreasing the aggressiveness will make it only more accurate, but it's polluting. If it's polluting, maybe it's too early, right? In that case, decreasing the aggressiveness may make sense. So I'm not going to go through all of these design decisions, but this is just to give you an example. If the prefetcher has high accuracy but it's late, you may want to increase its aggressiveness. In this case, uh, you may want to look at whether the prefetcher will actually be early by increasing its aggressiveness. And you can have a bunch of design decisions based on these different design metrics. And this is actually just one way of uh, designing the prefetcher to be more adaptive. Again, for example, if you have low accuracy and if the prefetcher is uh, not uh, in this category, it's not polluting, it's not late, uh, it's not not polluting, it's not not late, but it has low accuracy, you decrease the aggressiveness. Make sense? Okay. Uh, so if you do this if, and come up with these design decisions, which you can imagine are actually not easy to come up with because some of these you may say, oh, maybe you don't want to decrease the aggressiveness in that case, right? It really depends on what kind of performance impact you're having, but we cannot get the performance impact exactly because that's very difficult to measure. measure. Ideally, you would like to somehow measure what is my performance with prefetching versus what is my performance without prefetching for different kinds of aggressiveness. That's very, very difficult to do online. So you try to estimate what would happen by changing the knobs depending on these performance metrics. Assume that you've implemented something like this. What is the performance of that? So this actually, uh, this is uh, the result from this paper. Again, I show you no prefetching over here. Very aggressive implementation over here. Remember, this was the best implementation on average. And yet you use dynamic insertion policy based on these metrics. You dynamically insert prefetches at different places in the cache. And you adjust the aggressiveness dynamically using this. And you do both of them, FTP, feedback, directed prefetching. So you improve performance reasonably significantly compared to an aggressive prefetcher if you compare this bar and this bar. And in fact, these workloads that we're losing before by having a very aggressive prefetcher, or any kind of prefetcher, if you will, uh, now they're actually increased, they have actually increased performance. You can gain uh, more than 10% on these two workloads. These are scientific workloads uh, that actually uh, require a lot of memory bandwidth, too. So by intelligently managing the aggressiveness of the prefetcher, you can actually do, uh, get much better performance. That's the key takeaway here. And how do you manage the prefetcher performance? By looking at these performance metrics. This is by, by no means the best policy. If you're interested in more policies, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, so uh, any prefetcher that you see will be evaluated using these metrics. Let's take a look at a little bit more sophisticated prefetcher. Actually, this is, I didn't tell you which prefetcher this was. This was actually a stream-based uh, stream prefetcher. And you can look at the paper for uh, 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 a more detailed description of the prefetcher. But many of these prefetchers actually require regular patterns uh, to be effective, stride or stream prefetchers. Now let's ta uh, take a look at how we can prefetch for more irregular access patterns. Unfortunately, life doesn't consist of just regular access patterns. You have many irregular access patterns, linked data structures, for example. Uh, you can have indirect array accesses. You can have multiple regular strides that look like this. In this case, you may need to recognize this pattern, right? You can actually have a pattern-based prefetcher that recognizes this. You can have random access patterns, which may be difficult to prefetch for. Can you actually design a generalized prefetcher for all patterns? So we'll take a look at several prefetchers. One is correlation-based prefetchers, content-directed, and pre-computation-based prefetchers. Let's see how much we can cover. Uh, so what, uh, the idea of correlation-based prefetching, also called Markov-based prefetching, is this. If you have 
some kind of access pattern, the history of cache block addresses in terms of uh, time, how you access them, you may find out that after referencing a particular address, some addresses are more likely to be referenced next. And this is purely because of the access pattern and the layout of the data structures. Right. For example, in this access pattern, you see that if you reference A, 20% uh, of the time, you'll reference A again, right? Afterwards, right afterwards. 60% of the time, you'll reference B again, B after A, and remaining time, you'll reference C. If you reference B, it's guaranteed that you'll reference C next, based on this access pattern. If you just observe this, C comes after B 100% of the time, after you see B. So you can actually build a Marco model of this access pattern either dynamically or statically. In this case, I built the entire model over here. And this Marco model tells you uh, whenever you see an address, with what probability you'll see the next node that's connected to that address. Right. So here, for example, if you have just seen D, with 67% probability, you're going to see C. With 33% probability, you're going to see address E. So assuming that you somehow build this model in hardware or maybe in software, you can actually utilize this to do prefetching. Whenever you see address A, you consult this model and say, oh, maybe I'm, I should prefetch B because that's the most likely address that I'm going to touch next. Whenever you uh, see address B, you consult this model and the model tells you, oh, I'm going to prefetch C because that's the only address I've seen after I've touched B beforehand. Why does this make sense? Well, this makes sense because it, think about a linked list traversal, right? If you have a linked list traversal, if you're doing a linked list traversal, let's say you have nodes at addresses A, B, C, D, E. Well, this is the poster child, I guess, for Markov prefetching because in this case, assuming the linked list doesn't change and assuming that you're always traversing it from the head to tail, you're always seeing address B after you access address A. Right? You're always seeing address C after you access address B. You're always seeing address D after you access address C, dot, 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 dot. Right? So you have a perfect Markov model for this linked list traversal. So you, by recording what addresses you see next after you see address A, you can prefetch the next address. So that's the idea of a Markov prefetcher. Basically record the likely next addresses after seeing address A. In this case, A. Uh, like the next address are B, C, D in this access pattern. Here, it's B. Well, I guess here it's B, C, D next right away, but that's not what I meant. Uh, B follows A here. Uh, a follows A here. Uh, B follows A here. And B follows A here. And there, at some point, C follows A over here. OK. Uh, so next time A is accessed, you prefetch B, C, D. Now you can decide prefetching only B, the most likely one, right? if you record enough information. That may be a lot of information to record. Uh, in this case, A is said to be correlated with B, C, D because B, C, or D comes after A, right after A, after A is accessed. This, that's the idea of a correlation prefetcher. And you can prefetch up to N next addresses to actually increase coverage, right? Instead of prefetching only B, which is the most likely, you prefetch B, C, D, okay? So there are other ways of doing this, actually. Uh, this is just one idea. But let me actually finish this first. You can actually improve prefetch accuracy uh, by, by using multiple addresses as a key for the next address. What we're really, really doing here is we're using the current access, A, as a key for the next access. You have a key. This is my current address that I'm accessing, A. In the past, I've seen B come follow A. So I'm going to prefetch that A, B. In the past, I've also seen C follow A, so I'm going to prefetch that. In the past, I've also seen D follow A, so I'm going to prefetch that. But what if we did something like this? If you want to increase accuracy of this prediction, instead of using only one address as a key, you say, uh, I've seen A in the past. Now I'm seeing B. Before, when I've seen these axes in sequence, the next address I've, uh, I, I, I had seen was C. So I'm going to prefetch C only if I've seen A and B in a sequence. Now this improves accuracy because you need more information to make the prediction of what to prefetch next. You need to see A and B consecutively to prefetch C. Now this may reduce your coverage because you're not prefetching just by seeing A. Right? You need to wait for A and B to prefetch C. Okay? 
Now your address is A comma B, that pair is correlated with C. And this, uh, this paper actually describes, introduces this idea, this correlation prefetching. Let me go back to this a little bit. You could do this in a different way, right? You could actually, whenever you see A, you say, oh, the next few addresses that follow me are B, C, D. Maybe that's not a good example because uh, actually B, C, and D individually follow A as well, I believe. Oh, actually they don't. Maybe they do. Anyway, let's, say, let's pick this F. Uh, whenever I see F, the next few addresses that I'm going to access are E, A, B, right? Maybe you, s you record the next few addresses, and whenever you see F, you prefetch the next few addresses that you're going to access. So you could actually have many variations of this, which is pretty interesting. Now you can imagine, like, this could be a huge table, right? What if you have a billion ad addresses you see in a program? Well, yes, that's the downside of this approach, right? How, uh, how, how do you actually record all of these addresses? But before we go into the disadvantages, let's talk about the advantages. Uh, now this can co potentially cover arbitrary access patterns, right? This, you don't need to have any relationship between A, B, C, D, E. They could be potentially random. This linked list can be uh, constructed by randomly allocating nodes at different memory locations, right? That's beautiful. Linked data structures is one example. Actually, this, this works well for trees as well because trees have this more, uh, you have A, let's say B, C, of course, it becomes a little difficult for trees. E, F, G. But now if you've seen B, it's clear that you're not going to see F after that, right? If you're traversing the street. After B, usually it comes, uh, D or E comes next. So you can have uh, this Marco table enables you to uh, prefetch accu reasonably accurately, at least constrain the space of what pointers you're going to prefetch uh, when you're doing a tree traversal. Now, if you have a tree that's not binary, that's, that has eight children, then that may be difficult to uh, prefetch. Now, well, you, you can still prefetch eight of the children, but uh, you're probably going to traverse only one. Again, that depends on your access pattern. So this can cover arbitrary access patterns. It's good with linked data structures, especially. You can actually do this with streaming patterns, too, right? Except it's extremely inefficient, right? A streaming pattern can be recorded in a Markov table. Uh, I should learn how not to use this. So basically a streaming pattern, you have a address A, A plus 4, A plus 8, A plus 12, dot, dot, dot. Assuming that you come back and you do the same thing. Well, now, whenever you see address A, the next address you see is address A plus 4. Whenever you see address A plus 4, the next address you see is address A plus 8. Whenever you see address A plus 8, the next address you see is address A plus 12, dot, dot, dot. So you actually populate your Marco table with this. These are your keys and these are the next addresses. Now it's much less efficient than a streaming prefetcher because now you need to record every address you see and every next address you see after that. Right? It's terrible because it's a lot easier to do this with a stri stride based prefetcher. Right? You just need to store the last address you've seen and the stride. Now you're wasting a lot of these entries and that points to the disadvantage of this Marco prefetcher which is these correlation tables or Marco tables need to be very large for high coverage. So imagine a uh, 1 million entry linked list. You need to record all of those 1 million accesses. Let's say you're traversing this 1 million entry linked list once, twice, three times, four times, five times, the same order. It's great. Your accuracy would be nice. But if you have a small table, you'll forget every address you've seen right? by the time you reach that address. So your table needs to be very large. And recording every misaddress and subsequent address, subsequent misaddresses is infeasible in hardware. And people have tried to reduce the size with some success, but not, not a whole lot so far. The second is, at least the way I described it, you may get low timeliness, right? Because I'm seeing this address A, and I'm prefetching for the next address that I'm going to see. If you access the next address, right after you access this address, well, it's too late, right? So you really would like to prefetch uh, look ahead a little bit, right? And how do you look ahead? You can imagine other techniques, right? Instead of correlating with this address, you correlate with the next nth address. That's one possibility. Uh, or when you actually uh, fetch uh, fetch this address, you prefetch a lot of other addresses you can s you you have seen in succession uh, before. Okay, this can consume a lot of memory bandwidth, especially if you're prefetching a lot of accesses, right? If, if you want to improve coverage, 
If you're on the improved time list, you would like to prefetch a lot of addresses ahead. But now you you're run into the problem of memory bandwidth. This is how these different metrics interact, right? This, it's kind of an art to actually get this right. Especially when your probabilities are low, if, especially if your correlations are low, prefetching for multiple addresses may degrade performance. And the last disadvantage is, which is actually different from a stream prefetcher, this cannot reduce compulsory misses, right? You have to see an address and subsequent address at least once to be able to record them. Which means that if your miss is compulsory, you haven't seen that address, right? Well, you haven't seen that address before, so you, you must uh, not have recorded it. You cannot have recorded it. Whereas a stream prefetcher can reduce compulsory misses because stream prefetcher predicts ahead what you're going to access and you don't need to have seen that address before. Okay? Okay. Let's take a look at a couple of prefetchers and then I'm going to let you go. That means that we're not going to finish prefetching today. Which means that you may not be able to implement thread-based prefetchers for your lab. That may be difficult to do. I wouldn't suggest implementing a thread-based prefetcher. But maybe you can implement some of these other prefetchers. Marco table could be fun, for example. And you can show us that you test it with, the Marco, uh, with, uh, with a linked list. OK. Uh, so it's, uh, it's difficult to actually get these uh, pointer-based data structures prefetched well. But people have developed a lot of interesting ideas. One idea that I really like and that it makes a lot of sense is content-directed prefetching. Uh, this is a specialized prefetcher for pointer values. Marco prefetcher is not specialized, but it works well with pointer values, assuming these disadvantages can be tolerated somehow. The idea of content-directed prefetching is uh, whenever you fetch a cache block, identify the pointers in that cache block and speculatively predict that you're going to access those pointers and prefetch, send out prefetch requests for those pointers. Basically, you prefetch uh, the pointers, the cache blocks that are pointed to by these pointers. Does that make sense? It's pretty cool, right? This doesn't require any state in this form, at least, in this basic idea form, because you're already fetching the cache block. And you're just identifying the pointers and picking out those pointers and prefetching them. That's the idea. The upside, yeah, well, I've already uh, given you this. No state, at least no state uh, is needed to memorize or record past addresses. And you can eliminate compulsory misses in this case, right? Because you may have a pointer in that cache block that you've never seen before, you've never fetched before. The downside is, now you're indiscriminately prefetching all pointers in a cache block. What if you're not using any of them, right? They're just pointers. Maybe you're not going to access any of them. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So you could actually improve that with some software hints. Uh, how do you identify pointer addresses? This <laughs> begs the question. Uh, it's going to be similar to address value delta prediction. Do you guys remember address value delta prediction? Okay. In that lecture, I, well, last lecture, I mentioned that if uh, uh, if the effective address is very similar to the data value in top n bits, that means that the data value is likely to be a pointer, right? Because pointers are allocated from the same memory address space. So their top bits are likely to match. And people who developed this idea observed the same thing. Basically, they say if the top n bits of the cache block address matches the top n bits of the data value within that cache block, then that data value is likely to be a pointer. Basically, the, you can compare the address size values within a cache block with the cache block's address. And if the most significant few bits, few, determin uh, few, uh, few determined empirically, uh, match, then you can declare that a point. Let me give you an example. Let's assume that you're fetching this address, the, the cache block at this address from memory. And you fetched it, it, go, it goes slowly. And you bring the cache block from memory into the cache. Uh, and you have some bunch of values over here. And this is the address of the cache block. And these are the address size values uh, within the cache block. Basically, what content directed prefetching does is it has a virtual address predictor over here. Based on this virtual address, it tries to figure out which one is similar to this virtual address. Well, if we have, I think in this case, eight comparators that compare the top 12 bits in this case of the cache block address, virtual address, to, uh, to the data value that's stored uh, in these address sized uh, portions of the block. And only one of the comparators matches here and indicates that this is actually likely a pointer. And it may as well be, right? They look kind of similar. They're from the same address space. 
This may be a pointer, but it's not identified in this case. Right? There's no reason why this may not be a pointer. And there's no reason why this may not be a data value, but it's maybe unlikely to have data values that are kind of like this. Okay, and then that address is sent out to be prefetched with the anticipation that that's a pointer that you're going to access in the near future, perhaps after some processing, perhaps right away. Make sense? It's kind of cool, right? You don't need any state to do this. Well, there it's the downside is it's not very efficient. Uh, so hardware doesn't have enough information on pointers. So hardware, uh, so you, you, this may be some data value that you're prefetching for, so it may be useless, that's one thing. And you may actually be prefetching, uh, not prefetching for this pointer value that's actually interesting, right? So how do we improve its effectiveness? So, but software does have more information about pointers. And maybe you're prefetching lots of pointers here, but only one of them is going to be used. So how do you actually uh, communicate this information between the hardware and the software? So one idea is to have the compiler profile the program and provide hints as to which pointer addresses are likely useful to prefetch in a cache block. And the hardware can use these hints to prefetch only likely useful pointers. And I'll give you a very brief example and then we'll stop after that. And this is described in this paper. Uh, basically, if you look at this, uh, this is uh, doing a hash table lookup. And let's say you index into one of the linked lists in the hash table one of the buckets in the hash table, and you're searching for a key in that linked list. In this case, you're, you're really going through nodes that look like this. And each node has a key. Each node has a, a pointer to the next node. Each node has pointers to data. And this lookup function, basically it's, uh, the cache block looks like this. Basically, this is the cache block. Uh, well, actually, this, you could think of this as the hash hash table, and this is actually from a minimum spanning tree program, and this is a bucket, and the bucket looks like this. Basically, you have a bunch of, a linked list of keys, and the keys are connected to each other using these pointers, and the data values are hanging off the keys with different pointers. Now, if you actually would like to prefetch something, you really would like to prefetch these pointers, right? Such that you get, the, get all of the keys that you're going to search. It's unlikely that you're going to access these pointers. Because these pointers are accessed only if your key actually matches uh, the uh, value that's input. So if you had information, you would really like to prefetch these pointers and not prefetch these pointers. And these are many, many pointers. These could be many, many pointers, actually. In this case, there are two pointers. So that's the idea. If we can somehow determine which pointers are accessed more frequently, we prefetch those pointers. But if you have content prefetching, as I described it earlier, your layout of the data structure may look like this. Like this is key, data one pointer, data two pointer for the first node and the next pointer. Key, data one pointer, data two pointer, and the next pointer for the second node. If you have pure contact directed prefetching, what might happen is all of these pointers match, right? So you prefetch six of these blocks. Whereas you may want to prefetch only the next blocks. Basically, if you have information saying that the access pattern is such that next pointer is much more likely to be, pref uh, to be used than these data pointers. You communicate that information somehow to the hardware and prefetch only that. 